Everybody, welcome to another episode of 10K on the Bay. Today, I'm super excited to have Teresa Cox on the show again. Today, we're going to be talking about how we store and ship our inventory. And she has a cool new tool called Size Me Up that we're going to go over and it'll help us shipping. I would say that over half the questions I get are related to shipping. And then maybe 10% are how do I store my inventory? So it should be an awesome topic. Thanks for coming again. Why don't you give us a, a little bit of an intro and talk to us about you? Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I've been selling, like you said, um, well, you didn't say, but I've been selling on eBay for over 20 years now. I hit my 20 year mark in, in July and I uh, left 30, my career of 30 plus years in higher ed doing finance and operations. Um, and about two and a half years ago, and I've been selling full time online since then. And it's awesome. Love it. Amazing. So it's really good to talk to some of the so, veterans. You've been doing it for a while. And as far as storage goes, why don't you give us, uh, I'm going to show, do you want me to show the screen of what you have in mind? Or do you want to go over what you're going to build in the room that you're in right now? Let's, let's, well, first let me explain what my situation, because I think I've got a little more than that. So I, I'm, um, sold this, I have this big house in Phoenix area and I sold it about a year and a half ago and moved to an investment property I had three hours north near Flagstaff in Williams, Arizona. And that was a huge house on 12 and a half acres. And it had an outbuilding called a Quonset hut. And most people don't know what that is. It's a half, it's a half circle metal building that were popular after, uh, I think World War II, but it was 40 feet wide and 70 feet deep. So it's a huge building. In the back room that was about 40 by 15, is where I stored all my listed eBay inventory when I lived up there. And so sold that house to uh, some neighbors down the street and in June. And um, these people happened to have uh, three young girls. They had five kids all together, but a four-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 13-year-old. Uh, and um, list and take inventory and, you know, they helped me organize my ties. And uh, so when I sold this house to them, we came up with the idea of leaving my eBay inventory there. So I have close to 4,000 listings, almost 10,000 items, and I left it there. And the now 14-year-old uh, ships my eBay inventory for me on a daily basis. So my right now, my eBay business is literally in the hands of a 14-year-old. So that was a think out of the box um, realization because I didn't want to move all that stuff back down to the valley and um, it's working really well we've had uh, you know a couple of hiccups where labels got switched but I switch labels so you know you just fix it and move on no big deal um, but uh, an interesting thing because people have asked me about this and and I didn't know how to do this so I posted it in a Facebook group and said how do you know, how would you compensate? Like, this is my idea. How would you compensate somebody for just shipping your items? And somebody said, well, why don't you pay them 5% of your sales? So I tracked that. I, I timed myself on a Sunday night shipping on a Wednesday morning, and I did it on a various times and averaged it out, figured out how much it would be. And, you know, sometimes it averaged out to $18 an hour. Sometimes it was a little bit more, sometimes less. And I was like, you know, that's, that's pretty fair. I think that, you know, she would do that. And then as I was moving, I'm like, I'm not paying them anything for storage. So I said, how about we do this? How about I pay you 10% and that'll cover storage? And I said, and I provided all the shipping supplies and um, it's been working great. So if you want to think outside of the box and you want to move and don't want to move your inventory and you have somebody you trust, um, you know, that's, that's a good way. And it worked out. I sold a $300 jacket. She got $30 of it. You know, it's like, a lot of my items are twenty twenty five dollar items, but you know she she's averaging about a hundred a hundred and twenty dollars a week for the stuff that she ships so and I do have some stuff here that I ship, but about five percent so I like that idea because you don't have to i mean here's the thing like if you pay people let's say a dollar an item to ship something and you really go cheap and you do a piecemeal and they never get really rewarded they're gonna leave they're not gonna be loyal that's too little so like i have found so far like i'm trying to buy lunch for my photographer i'm trying to do <laughs> i'm trying to be their best friend otherwise yeah. it's easy for them to leave yeah you know what um 
before I moved to the to Flagstaff, I had a fabulous mail carrier, Amy. Amy took care of me and I took care of Amy. And I tell people all the time, just like you're talking about your photographer, take care of your, it's the little things. So at Christmas time, I would leave Amy full-size candy bars. She'd come to my house and you know that would be her dinner because she wouldn't get back to the post office at eight o'clock at night. So it was just a little sugar push me up at the end of the day. In the um, summer in the Phoenix heat, I would freeze bottles of water and I would um, sit out on the front porch for her. So by the time she got to my house at noon or one o'clock, she had a nice cold drink. Um, little things, you take care of your people and they take care of you. And I always say your mail carrier is your number one employee that's not on your payroll. So treat them that way. So are you showing that picture? Okay. Um, Sorry, I, I was on mute. Yeah, I was gonna say, can you tell us what this picture is? Okay, so this is, so because 95% of my listed items are still three hours away, this is what I did when I moved um, unlisted items. And, and some people know my story, some people don't. I moved out of this big six bedroom, three bath house a year and a half ago. And I'm selling basically my personal belongings. And so I had, um, I had all this stuff that, you know, when I was in Williams, I was supposed to be listing and selling it. And it just really didn't happen. So um, um, that I came up with, with it's a combination. Um, Christine Bonanno, who's another seller that's in New York, I was at, I went to visit her and help her with the project she was working on. And she listens to you, Chris, and she came up and we were trying to figure out how to organize her basement. And she did this, this is her idea. And she had um, three boxes across, and, and these are eBay branded boxes, I'll show you. This is the, um, you can't see it on the shelf, but the eBay branded boxes, and it's the, um, what is it, the 12 by four, 18 by 14 by 12. Okay. And so I got these free with my shipping thing. Now, I labeled them with just these little labels that I had on hand, but I just okay. did, you know, box one through 75 or whatever it is. And then they line okay. up on this, these shelves. These shelves are 48 inches wide and they're 18 inches mm -hmm. deep. And I got the ones that have six shelves on them. So I can fit, you can fit 18 on a shelf, but I've got 15 so I can use the top shelf for um, oversized items. So these and are numbered one the, through 75? Yeah, uh, one through 75 right now. And then, but the, the whole concept and what has made it so easy to move in is um, that I just put stuff in a box. And the idea is that I will take box number 32 and I will go and I will list box, take pictures and list box 32 and then put box 32 back. And then in the um, custom field, um, I'll, you know, item location, box 32. And it's funny because while I was, putting some stuff in these boxes, I'm like, I'm, I'm th thinking I'm never gonna wanna list this box. And so then I thought to myself, I'm gonna have a random number generator. And I'm just gonna do a random number generator and someday it's gonna say box 72. And then that's what I'm gonna have to list that day. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just kind of thinking things out that way to make it more fun and have a variety and I'm not, while a lot of things are similar, like I'll have a bunch of Christmas stuff in one box, some of them are just random stuff that came, this fits in this box. So, um, and I like, the way, I like the way it looks. It's nice and neat in the garage. It's a two car garage. I plan on being able to put my car in the garage. We'll I have see what the, happens. I, I literally have the identical system. Um, so I number mine B00 to B99. So there's a hundred um, bins in a row. Um, organized, I just, but I have the same shelves, but I actually stack them seven high. Um, but I'm, wow. I'm tall, so for me, I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I'm super tall, so I can reach up there. But five is probably more safe. If I were to ever have staff ship for me, I wouldn't have the row six and seven. It's too high. If that falls on them, that would smash a small person. So um, five rows high is is safe. Seven is kind of pushing it. But I love that they're on wheels. You can move it around. Um, yes, that's, I think that's, really that's important. key. It's also key. raised. It's raised so that, you know, bugs and rodents and stuff, it's hard for them to get into it. Um, and then I do the same thing now. Inside these bins, I number things 1 through 20. And so I, I ah. clip these, these, these clips on it. And then um, after I sell it, I put this on a different item. So all of my bins stay full. 
there are no bins that are half full or three quarters full. And I want 10,000 items as everyone knows. So I need 500 of these bins. So it's also easy for me to visualize how long it's going to take because I'm in the middle of row C. So once I get this, um, all these drafts and things put up, I'll be right around 5,000 items. But when it goes A, B, C, D, E, zero, zero, um, that'll be 10,000 items. And it'll fit um, in a two-car garage pretty comfortably. So I won't be able to park my car in it. But, but you know, as far as getting all the inventory into your into your garage, this makes it super easy, guys. I put this in the custom SKU. And I also record what week it is and how much it is. So B0020 colon 10, let's say I paid 10 bucks, colon 45, which would mean week number 45. And I, I stole that from a consignment shop. That's how they determine when they discount, is how what week it is. Yeah. So if it's if it's getting close to that week again after a year, they send the items to auction. Um, and I thought that was an interesting way to do it. But that way you don't keep items longer than a year. If you are doing consignment, that storage space can add up. Yep. Um, but I love those shelves. Um, I think they're awesome. Um, and so, and they're only about you can you can find them for about fifty bucks on eBay. Fifty bucks with free shipping. That's right. They're fifty to sixty bucks. I have a link in my in my description if you guys want to check out the shelves. Um, I yeah. recommend you get metal shelves. Like I have these I have cheap plastic shelves that I tried. Just get the metal ones. It's only like ten bucks more, and they last a lot longer. Um, also, I do want to say the wheels are key. I don't know if the plastic one. Do I the like ones your have wheels. The plastic ones have wheels. I like your okay. system a little bit better than mine because my bins, ha um, they taper in. Yours are yeah. perfectly square. They fit in. You can fit a little bit more item, a little bit more stuff in it. And I also recommend you mix your items. If you have yes. a hat, a candlestick holder in there, it's so easy to find. If you have all the identical items, it's confusing sometimes. And um, you might not ship the wrong thing, but if you ever have somebody helping you, they could easily ship you know, oh. something that looks very, very similar. No, I think you, I listened to one of your things and you mentioned that before. And I was like, you know, I, in Williams, I've got a bin of all these Dan skin shorts and inevitably I think I'm pulling the size small and I ship the size medium and then it's got to go. And I'm like, so when you made that, I went, yeah, I need to mix things up. And I like this system better too, because in the Williams inventory system, I've got all my Christmas together, all my Halloween together, all my clothing. Then when you list new stuff, merging it never happened. And so it was like I never got that whole system down. And it's like then you have to do inventory. So I like the idea of having box number seven and anything I list today. Well, this is empty because I pulled it off the shelf. But you know, anything that I unpack that comes out of box seven is going to be listed. It's still going to be in box seven. So. I also like, I used to do the little mini label like you have, and I switched to the full half label. And it's a lot easier to see. And I'm t designing it so that um, I can have somebody I trust come and ship for me when I take vacation. I don't want to be one of those eBay people that can never go anywhere. So yeah. I want to organize it, make it as easy as possible. So they print the label. This actually prints on the label. So I can walk straight to the item. And that makes it a lot easier. You can double check. And since I started printing this on the, the label, I, I no longer mix up packages. And um, there's a lot of people who are scared and they ship one item at a time so they don't mix it up. That's not going to, yeah. when you start scaling, you need to do multi item shipping. So, how does it print on the label? Is it from eBay? Yeah, it's from eBay. So you can choose to print right here on the label um, the item number. You can do a you can customize whatever thirty characters you want to put on here. And I have it default to the custom SKU. So it puts in there. And also because I, I record the cost on my custom SKU, I can figure out the profit for that day immediately because I can just yeah. add up all the costs for that day. So it's easy to see how much revenue you have. But unless you print for me, I can look at my labels and say, OK, my 10 items cost 130 bucks today easily and get an idea of where I'm at um, profit wise, because in the end, that's where we're going. Also, if you separate the things with a column afterwards, you can delineate that in an yes. Excel spreadsheet. Um, so I actually I need to add um, in between B00, I need to put another colon so I can separate by bin and number. So I now ah. need to go add in another colon in there. That way you can make sure. Also, I store these items based on date in the folders now for pictures. So in case 
I put the wrong SKU number in there, I can still find it because I have the picture. Um, when I take my photographs, this is the first and the last picture. Yeah. So, okay. And I used to do only the first or only the last, but then people would get confused when they were helping me listing. So now I'm just saying in between these two paper cl or clothes pins are the pictures. Also, make sure the 12th picture is this. And then oh. I can I can also double double check. So it's in the photo, it's in my spreadsheet, it's in the folder because I want this redundancy because you know, w once you get over 500 items, it's so easy to lose something. Yep, it is. No, I like I like the I like the idea of clothes pins. I really do. Now, do you do a lot of clothes? How do you do that with um uh hard items? So hard goods um so hard goods, right yeah. here, I do the same thing. Um, the clothes pin is just on the box. So it's just like clipped on the box. Okay. And then um so I go A through E for cl um clothing or small items that fit in these bins and then I'm still working on a box wall. But the okay. way that I'm doing it is um, I'm starting with X, Y, Z with hard goods, and I pre-box most of my items unless they're in a box. So they're either okay. pre-boxed or they're already in a box, and that way they stack sort of comfortably. Um, okay. And then that's how I'm trying to organize the pre-packaging. And then my photographer pre-packages items now oh, um, wow. unless they just slide into a poly mailer. If it's, if it's that simple, then I can do it myself. It doesn't add too much time. But if it's a box, it's required that they box the item, and okay. um, they usually don't don't have as many problems. And this is this is how I sort of worked it out. You don't need to really measure hard goods. Nope. In my opinion, there's no measurements really. So I'm like, you don't have to take pictures of the measurements. So because of that, you don't get free lunch. You still have to package my items in the box. <laughs> and so it's been fine. They've been okay with it, and they like um, they like it because there's way less pictures with a brand new item. Yeah. It's like front yep. back UPC code done. Awesome. So I gotta try to streamline it there. And my photographer loves it. He thinks this is the best job. And I want to give one more tip to people out there, which is he has a full plate. This is his main gig. If I don't have a thousand items for him to to photograph, I get other eBay sellers in the area to give me their stuff. I want his main gig to be photographing. And if you don't pay your people enough, they need other incomes. And if they get a real job, you're you're gonna take you're gonna go on the back burner and they're not gonna help you anymore. So how do you compensate your photographer? A dollar an item. Okay. So he does between 150 and 250 items a day, depending on how motivated he is. Um, and you know, I, I have a bunch of different um, setups because I don't like white background, but some of the people that he photographs for do. They do like white background. So I have both. I have a white background available if people want to do it that way. Eventually, I want him to only photograph my stuff. Yeah, but I'm just really happy that he's full because that capacity issue, you can just tell he's much more relaxed at work versus a normal independent contractor is like hustling to figure out what other gig they can do. Like, I, I mean, at least for me in the Bay Area, it's so expensive. People will take a one hour break to take an interview and what and you can't really say, like, don't do that because you're not paying yeah. them enough to survive. Yeah. So like this guy, um, he knows he can work as much or as little as he want between nine and four. And if he doesn't want to show up, like today he didn't want to show up, I have to do the photographs. So today was pretty hectic, but my VA is expecting 100 items to go into the folder every day for in Dropbox to start listing. And um, in questions on how to use InkFrog, because I'm switching to that process. And yeah. I think people need to be patient too. I'm paying my VA 10 bucks every time he finds an improvement. Okay, good. So I'm like, I'm like, your job... Okay, so I learned this from Toyota. No problem I'm telling him there's always a problem. Find a yep. problem when you're working so I can fix it. If you don't have a problem, then you're not doing your job because it can always get better and easier and faster. And I'm going to pay you the same. So what that means, in theory, is that your hourly is going to go up. If we keep making this go up, your hourly is going to go up to the point where, I mean, I've seen people draft 20 items in an hour. I think that's pretty much the max. Yeah. Um, more than that, and you're going to burn out. Yeah, I agree. And also, he even though I think that's the max, he's really only at like six or seven. Really? I'm paying 70 cents per listing. Okay, okay. For, for drafting. So 70 cents there, a dollar for the item. Um, I build the dollar 70 into the cost. So it goes okay. um, B0020, 1170 if it was a $10 item. And also, I pay both of them through PayPal. 
<laughs> so I'm trying to make this super crispy, pay for everything on my PayPal debit, um, the business bank card or the business credit card, those three things, give it to a CPA and um, be done with it. That'd be done with it. That's the plan to try to um, do that. And also the cheapest type of VA work is data entry. So if we can figure out how to get the um, your accounting simplified, like it's stored in the custom SKU, they can prepare the reports for your CPA, which is even better because a CPA is much cheaper than a CPA. Yeah. Yeah, uh, VA, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about your shipping okay. um, guide because this is this is exciting. I want to hear the whole story. Okay, so I um, so we talk about networking and networking is huge. And um, so I uh, I'll tell you how I ended up in New York in August. Um, I uh, this this woman at eBay Open accosted me, and I I say it jokingly. She, I, she, we were at a meetup on Monday night and she, we were standing there and she's like, she came up, she was like, oh my gosh, Teresa Cox, Teresa, you're the reason I'm here. And I'm like, what? Who are you? <laughs> and so she told me that um, she had posted in Jason's group, the thrifting board, um, that, you know, she was afraid to travel by herself. You know, she lived in New York to go to New York. She'd never travel by herself. And, you know, I'm always encouraging people and I'm telling them, once you get there, you won't be alone. It'll be okay. And, I told her that you know if you get to Vegas and you can't figure out how to Uber or get a cab from the airport to the hotel, I will promise you I will pick you up. Once you get to the the hotel, you know I'll be your friend, but you won't need me. So um, so I was just very impressed with you know somebody that 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 would do that, and I you know at that point I'm thinking no big deal. When she told me that her husband sent her a dozen red roses to her room because he was so proud of what she did that's when it really dawned on me. This was huge for this woman. And so, um, you know, we hit it off and, and, and whatever. And then we chatted a couple of uh, times and she was working on this really awesome project. And I said, Hey, um, she came to a point where I had more experience in doing something than she did. And I said, well, I'll, I'll fly back there and I'll come help you. She's like, you will. And so, through that process, we ended up at dinner one night um, with some friends of hers, Nanette and Steve, and we're just talking. And these guys are, you know, just ideas flow. And so I had this, I, I had this thing. This is this is my um, this is my tool that I would use um, to measure the thickness of a package. And we went from that. I showed a wait, picture wait, of it. You, you, you have to tell people what that's made out of. Oh, <laughs> this is made out of coffee stir sticks and dental floss. And it has been at my desk for probably four years now. And I use this constantly to measure the thickness of a package that I was shipping internationally. And I'll show you more how it works later. But we went from that and then, you know, and I've tried to get people to, I've showed this to several people and uh, Dennis Waddell in the thrifting board came up with this acrylic version. This is a wooden ver version. And I was like, okay, that's, I like that, but it wasn't long enough. But we were working on another version. And then uh, we go to dinner with Steve and Nanette, and that was on a Saturday night. And she calls us on Monday. She's like, we got to go back to dinner. We got to go to dinner. And so we went to dinner, and she has this package. And this was the first, um, I want to call it the real rendition. So, the, and it's kind of long. And she basically talked about it, you know, how she made it longer because of the, the size requirements. So, Fast forward to we sat at dinner that night and we um, wrote we all wrote up, wrote on this and she had this mail me mail me eBay mail me eBay or something like that and we're like yeah we don't really want to do the eBay thing on there and it was actually Christine the woman that that um, I encouraged to go to eBay that came up with the name size me up and so she was I don't know what she said and everybody at the same time she's like size me up and it was like yeah that's it. And so basically what this tool is, is it is a, will help you determine whether your international package can ship international first class letter or package. And let me explain that to you. So eBay does not have an international first class letter option. The reason they don't have that is because if you ship something international first class letter, it goes door to country. International first class package goes door to door. So I tell people, if you're not comfortable taking that risk, then don't do it. I've been doing shipping international first class letters for 20 years. I have never had a package go missing. 
So if you had, you know, if it's a $12 or $20 item and you don't want to take that risk if it doesn't show up that you might have to refund it, then don't then ship it as a package. And prices. So I do, so I, you know, I like to streamline and automate. So I make things very easy. I don't do GPS. Um, I tested it out for six months and my international sales were literally zero. And right now my international sales are about, it's over 25%, but I haven't quite hit 30% yet. And um, I make it easy. Anything zero to eight ounces is $14.99. Nine ounces to two pounds is $24.99. Two to three is $34.99, and three to four is $44.99. I rarely ship anything over four pounds. And I do that, I make that, that price because it's quick and easy to list if you just know those numbers off the top of your head. So sometimes it's gonna be cheaper to ship it, a little cheaper to ship it to uh, Great Britain and Australia, but you know it's gonna be by a dollar, maybe two. And because all 4,000 of my listings have free shipping, Every one of them has shipping built in. So even if I'm losing $2 shipping it to Great Britain, I'm not losing money because I have $5 built into the price of the item. So I want to you know, uh, let people know that. Now, so typically, so if, let's say we sold four of these. I don't even know what they are. These are something makeup. And if we sold four of these and they went international, they weigh, this weighs six ounces. We would take it. We would put it in this package, and you can see that it's um, pretty thick. It is, actually it is about two and a half inches thick. And it's six ounces, so based on that, up to eight ounces is $14.99. I would list this and I would charge, I would add $14.99 for international shipping. What this tool does is if it fits in this slot, the maximum for international first class letter is three quarters of an inch. So this space is three quarters of an inch. So if you're gonna ship one, that's no big deal. So one, you put one in here, fold it over, and easy. So now I know I can ship that international first class letter. And my competitors aren't gonna know that, so they're gonna charge $14.99. But as an international first class letter, to Australia, it's six ninety seven, so that's a eight dollar savings. Now, what if you have four of these? So, in four of them, it's easy. Take a bigger envelope, put them in here, layer them one single layer, and you're still going to ship them all four for the same price. Oh my goodness. Guys, I hope you just wrote that down. My mind's blown. So, you know, when you when you do international first class shipping, you have, you know, your first item is $14.99 and the second item is seven dollars. I I usually do half of the list price, half of the whatever the first one is. So literally, you have to put something in for the cost of the second item. So if I do this and I have it listed, it's it's it actually is $6.97. So if I list it for $6.99. And then I do this every additional one is $2. I'm going to make money on the postage, and the buyer is going to think they're getting a great item. That's a win, I mean, win a great, everybody. A great deal. So, yeah, so, you know, just um, we got these priced at 19 dollars and, you know, you ship two packages. Selling one of these, I would say $8. Selling four of them, if you price it compared to your competitor, that's you know you can save thirty two dollars. So one or two items you're going to save um, the cost of the tool. And so and we've done some really cool things on here. We've made it. We printed it on both sides. So if you're right-handed or you're left-handed, it works. We've got centimeters and inches on it. We've printed right on there what the um, USPS rules are about. Uh, maximum is 12 inches, maximum height is 12 inches, maximum length is 15. So you have to keep those in mind. And maximum uh, thickness is three quarters of an inch. So little handle here so you can just hang it up by your shipping station, your listing station, and, you know, go from there. So, you know, I think that um, I the, ship direct the customer and offer a global shipping program, and nobody chooses the global shipping program. Yeah. So it must be significant. I think it's because buyers don't realize. I don't. 
I don't think it actually costs the buyers more. I just think that they feel like it does because they're paying for the customs and the duties and everything up front. Mm. And so I think that's the difference. And, um, but yeah, I just, I didn't have any um, uh, sale, any international sales when I did global shipping for six months. So I changed. Wow, that's so cool. 25% international shipping. I let's see today I did 16 and four so 20 a little over 20 percent for me probably as well international shipping is is big and I want everyone out there to realize that the market outside the US is bigger than here yes so more of eBay is outside of the US so if you're not yeah, offering it, international shipping you may miss a couple of deals yeah and, and, and you know, be friendly to those people there I mean I ship to every country I have nothing blocked I don't you know um, like I said, never really had an issue with uh, uh, anything that's not shipped. But I do want people to understand you get uh, tracking from door to country and not door to door. And that makes a difference. And so if you can't take that risk, then, um, you know, spend the $14.99 and ship it international first class package. So before, before you had this, because you made your little copy stick thing, how yeah. did you do it? How did you do I this? just... I just did it like this, you know. I don't know if you can see that. I just so you know. is is the half inch. Wait, what what is what is the diameter of that? What is it's it's three quarters of an inch thick. So the whole the the package can't be and okay. it has to be uniform three quarters of an inch. So you can't have a bump in your package that's you know an inch thick and expect it to go as international first class letter. Which is why. So what happens if you should? Which is which is why we do it. You know, we, I suggest doing it like this, so that you can make sure that it's uniform. What what happens if you ship it and it's wider than that? Um, I don't know. It, I've never done that. it, it, it gets stopped for for incorrect postage, probably, and gets sent. Yeah, back. probably probably either gets sent back or the, your buyer, which would be worse if your buyer had to pay additional postage for it. That would be worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to have that happen. I just so, got um, extra wide bags from eBay to try out. And I was just thinking, let's see. Um, like for example, a thick pair of jeans, right? Oh, yeah, a those. Thick, a thick pair of jeans may not fit in no. three quarters of an inch. But if you were, um, if you folded it in, let's say, in half twice, it wouldn't fit. But if you just fold it in half, like one and a half times, it might actually make it in there, but it had to be spread out like this. Yeah. In order to fit into there. Yeah, the problem would probably be with a button if it had a button on it. Now I will ship, I will ship t-shirts or dress shirts. Um, mm. You just have to give it, uh, you know, just have to lay them in a flat. And so I like the bubble mailers for that, just because it provides a little stability. Now, the actual USPS rules say that it cannot be rigid. Well, and um, I've shipped things, I'll put them in a manila folder or I'll ship them in uh, something just to give it some stability, but it's still flexible. Um, I've shipped CDs, they're rigid, but I've shipped CDs, never had an issue with it. So, um, you know, you just need to know the rules and take the risk if you want to, like I you know. Do you, have, do you offer international priority as well? Uh, I don't, I never have. Um, I've got the uh, uh, what do you the guaranteed shipping thing. Um, I haven't played with the tables yet, but um, no, it takes seven to ten days. I mean, most of the international stuff gets arrives in seven days. If the customer will go and deal with the customs part, I'm dealing with somebody that hasn't had it, their item hasn't arrived yet, and I think it's stuck in customs. Um, but you know, if they if they know how to deal with the customs issues, then um, you know, seven days, ten days max. I have a, um, a pair of shoes going to um, Italy and there's a customs problem and it's stuck in limbo and it's been there for 14 days and on my end it says hold for pickup and they don't know how to do it yes so have you ever had a, a customer not be not be able to figure out how to deal with their own country does it just get sent back to you what happens it gets it sometimes it gets it depends on the country Italy may um, yeah I don't know these are the reasons why people will use GP, GSP because then they don't have to deal with this. But for the most part, I tell them to just get a hold of their local post office and their local 
postal carrier will let them know what they need to do. For somebody from the U.S., I have no idea how to get a hold of you know the the uh, Italian. Um, I eventually had things get shipped back, but it takes 30 to 60 days. It takes a long time. And you know, by that time, a lot of times, like like you know, I'll try to do the right thing and I'll try to refund the person's money, and I probably am successful in that maybe 50 percent of the time. Where you try to reach out to them and say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I got this package back. I understand." Um, you know, do you want me to try to reship it? Do you want me to give you a refund? And about 50% of the time, um, I'll, re I'll, I'll actually get a hold of them to give them a refund. So I just want to bring up a point here, guys. If you ship a lot of packages international, like I shipped, I don't know, hundreds of packages internationally direct to the customer, and twice I've had some a hiccup. One was the guy couldn't figure out the customs and it got sent back to me. No problem. Um, obviously, I had to eat the international shipping, but that's fine. Right. It happens so infrequently that it doesn't matter. The other time, the person said, uh, item not as received, and uh, opened the case. And immediately, because it had been like 45 days, um, I said, why don't we go ahead and close it in there? Because I, I didn't want a defect. So I said, why don't we just close it, and I'll just wait for it to come back. So I closed the case. The next day, he accepted the package. Yeah. So that person was one of those people that potentially would scam you. And in, and eBay still gave me my money back. So it's not like because if it if you can't it's not something that you can always do, but eBay will work with you. Like if obviously somebody is defrauding you, they they still stand behind their sellers. I haven't had yeah. any issues with with eBay not reversing one of these on really, really small situations where stuff like that may yeah. happen. It's yeah, I think people it. need I think sellers need to get over the fear. And what I've learned from talking to a lot of you know newer sellers is they don't have the margins. Like they can't afford it. They look at they look at each sale. I made money on this. I lost money on this. And and I tell you, you have to look globally. Like Target doesn't say, oh look, we made three dollars on this pair of pants. Oh, but we lost twelve on this microwave. They don't do. You have to look at the the global picture. And if you don't have it in your profit margins to offer a sale or pay for promoted listings or lose um, refund somebody. Twelve dollars on an item they bought and didn't get, then you need to re you need to look at your profit margins. Um, I want to point out that, like, go ahead. No, I was going to say, new sellers think you have to have the lowest price to sell an item, and I'm always saying no. You have to higher priced items sell just as well as low priced items. Agreed. And plus, I have this conspiracy theory that eBay promotes higher, more expensive items anyway because they make more fees. If I was eBay and I, and I was trying to make the most money, I would hide low-priced bad sellers, and I would promote high-priced good sellers because it's it's like a win-win. Customers would be happy, and I get more fees. Well, unless eBay has to satisfy both the buyer and the seller. It's true. So if the if the buyers come to eBay and they consistently think that the stuff on eBay is too expensive, then they're going to, I think, I think it's a tough balancing act. So I like your conspiracy theory, but, and maybe it works 80, 20, I don't know. But, um, I think eBay does a great job of keeping that balance for both buyers and sellers. I mean, I guess if you have, all, you have to, all you have to do is be cheaper than Amazon. But you know what I also found is that, don't research like we do. They just go it's and they true. type in an item and they, you know, okay, here it is. Oh, it's free shipping. Great. $34.99. That's awesome. I buy it. They don't know that, you know, somebody else is selling it for $12.99 with $2 shipping. Scott in the chat is asking if you have a link or um, like a way people can check out the GSP prices. Um, do you know where people would look? I have no idea where you would look for that. No, I think that somebody, um, I don't know. I think it was in a forum someplace where uh, somebody from eBay, an eBay employee said that um, their fee and everything is added in there. But unless you know somebody that's international buying, um, you know, maybe maybe I'll ask, um, Helen lives in Australia, and I'll ask her if she, if she does anything, and how, if she can see it on her end. So I've got, I know somebody that lives in Australia that I can ask, but that's a good question because I, I don't really know. I like to go into my own listings in a private browser sometimes and change the country. 
I mean, that's not a that's not a chart, but that's like a manual way of checking to see. You know, somebody says, "Oh, yeah. well, it's too much. I have to pay a lot of customs." Then you can get an idea of what they have to pay. Um, and also, if you look at large sellers, the majority of their negative feedback is customs duties that people didn't yeah. know about. So, like dealing with international shipping, in my opinion, is worth it. And don't get hung up by the fact there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues even if you only sell domestically. Right. It's just going to happen. Just shipping. Shipping to Italy is just as easy as shipping to LA. I mean, there's, I mean, eBay makes it so different. Now I get it. A lot of um, old school people and I talk, call it old school mentality. And when I type it out, I usually use S K O O L um, because it's old school because people don't understand that things have changed over the last even five years. And People are still doing things the way we did eBay in 2000 and e-commerce, global e-commerce has changed so much that it used to be a problem to ship to Italy because the Italian postmasters would steal the package. It's not a problem anymore because everybody's so used to e-commerce and global shipping that it just doesn't happen in countries. Agreed. And I think if you guys are reselling, guys, I think this is an awesome tribute to, to Teresa because she has another product. Like if you're selling on eBay, make your own stuff because it's important to diversify. Don't just only have one kind of income. If you have an idea, turn it into a product. I'm sure that the Scotty Peeler um, and the Scotty Mailer, those are products designed by eBay sellers for eBay sellers. If you have yeah. an itch that you want to scratch, like, you know, it's annoying to get the labels off, invent the tool that removes it and sells it. This is the community that would do it. So like, hopefully um, for you guys, it's worth it to just buy this little device that Teresa made instead of making one of the coffee sticks. It's not worth the money to, to create that. Yeah, it's, I, I need to ask um, Nanette and Steve what the, what the name of this uh, material is, but it's, it's like a plasticky, it's not cardboard, but it's a plastically, uh, I don't know, something or other so you can see it's, it's flexible but it's hard enough that it's not to whack your kids with it <laughs> are you actually hang that up no because i don't have any nails in my walls yet <laughs> oh, that's true. you should show you, us the space behind you it's very entertaining okay so part of my move is that i'm going to actually put my office in my the master bedroom which is where this is and so while that looks a little more set up that's not that's my second computer I got to get my real computer set up. That is just a little too many, a little overwhelming. That looks like everybody's death pile. I know. <laughs> my death piles are all in boxes in my office. Nice and neat and orderly. And I, I think that that's the way you should deal with death piles. Guys, you need at least one area of your house that doesn't have any crap in it so that you can use that area to list. Uh, you can't, if you can see excess inventory in your peripheral view, you're not going to list very fast. It's going to over. It's yeah. going to overwhelm you. Yeah. In my opinion. Well, um, in so my, you, in, when you list, do you list one box at a time? Yeah, I haven't actually listed. I mean, I've. I've what? That's the goal. That's the vision. Um, what I really like about this system is when I get returns back, I don't have to worry about oh, but my Christmas stuff is in Williams and I'm here. It's like okay, so this is a, a Christmas stocking. It goes in box three. I change the um, quantity and I put box three, Gilbert, and then box three. And then if I have some, if I have one item here and uh, you know six of them are in Williams, then it's G three and then a slash Williams, whatever location it is in there. And then that way, if I have it, I can ship it and try to get rid of mine first. So do you, do you feel like as a, do you consider yourself an old school seller? Uh, no, I mean, old school and doing the same things I did 20 years ago. Absolutely not. Um, I think that being, you know, being a full-time seller and being involved in the eBay community, you stay on top of things and you, you know, like, uh, you know what's happening, the new things that are out, and you change and adjust your, and, and that's what I do. I mean, I still remember when we had to wait for checks to clear and having to go to the post office to get your item weighed. And, you know, we didn't have online postage. We didn't have PayPal until PayPal. I opened my PayPal account in January of 2000. So I wow. had four, year, four years of collecting checks. And I remember when I opened it, um, PayPal was giving five dollars um, for everybody that created a new account. 
And I remember I bought a CD of apps for my BlackBerry and it was $5. And if I opened a PayPal account, then I got the $5 back. So the CD was free and I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and so I got my BlackBerry app CD for free. So um, you remember Dutch auctions? I don't even know what that is. Dutch auctions? Oh yeah. yeah. And then back in the day, actually my current eBay ID I created on July 28th, 1996, but I had one before that. And I'm, you know, it was something, it was, it was a work email address. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to use that anymore. Let me just create a new one. And, you know, today I'm kicking myself because I have no idea what day I actually really started on eBay, but it was before anybody, you know, my friends and stuff were doing back when they had the old, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what it was called. eBay or auction something or other, but yeah, it's, it's fun, you know, and it's definitely come a long way. I just also want to point out one more thing that uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm no spring chicken, but I would consider the new school seller as a seller that doesn't expect anything to last. I don't mean, I don't meet very many new sellers that are expecting features to stay the same. They're just constantly adapting okay. like, okay, because if you just joined eBay this year, like me taking it seriously, there's been changes in guaranteed delivery. There's been changes in promoted listings. There's been like, four or five major changes to the website this year and i haven't i don't i don't haven't complained one time it's going to change i'm just assuming it's going to change constantly so you just adapt and move and uh, if you were to use the energy of complaining why it wasn't like it used to be more productively i think it would be better but i just meet a lot of younger sellers that are like okay it's going to constantly be changing just like me the attitude is different i think that's an awesome observation that I don't think I had made, but I think you're absolutely right that um, some of those old timers that have been on the platform, I don't complain, but you're right. I think that the people that do complain about changing are the ones that aren't used to living in a changing a world that changes so fast. I mean, you know that it, that the platform's four major changes. I just know there's been changing. I don't stop and count them, but you know, you know that because um, that's your world and you know, phone updates and things constantly changing. You know, my mom hates it when we update her computer because, but like we do, she does it by rote memorization. So if she that's wants right. to go to Excel, she doesn't know how to get it except for that she clicks on her Excel that's over here on her screen up in the right hand corner, and you mess that up, and she's all messed up. So that's a, that's a great observation, and I think you're right. And I also see like Gwen is in the chat, and last night I was listening with her. Uh, which I think is great, guys. If you find a partner to list yeah, with yeah. you, you guys can keep each other company like this and just in the background, make sure that you're not, uh, you make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And she cross lists on Poshmark and Mercari at the same time. So imagine like being at the point now where you think one platform is not even enough and you're trying to maximize your exposure across three platforms. This is coming. And if another thing pops up, if Shmibe pops up and you want to get on that too, <laughs> you, just, you just add it to your rotation and get used to it. Cause it's going to, that may be the next big thing. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's important to realize guys, eBay has been declining the last five years in a row. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, but there's so many new platforms popping up that take some of the market share. So yeah. you need to look, you need to look at it. If you learn how to sell on Poshmark, it will 100% help you with your eBay. You just you know, going to learn new, new tips. I started to watch a, um, a show on Posh. Jason had somebody that was a Poshmark seller on his show and I started to watch it and I haven't finished it because I have a ton of lucky brand stuff that I need to sell and I want to, uh, sell it on Poshmark because somebody told me, you know, that's where you need to sell your lucky brand stuff. And I'm like, okay, it's not selling on eBay. It's not selling on Amazon. And it's, it's from a, a store clearance that uh, I think closed out last May. And I just, I mean, I've moved a lot of it, but I need to move the rest of it. And so I'm like, this is a great platform. Now my whole thing with pictures with Poshmark, I don't use my camera, my phone for a camera. And I know that if some of those sites offer up and whatever, you couldn't take a, um, a web image. And so that was a big, that was a big, you know, I wanted to just take like all my American girl stuff that I had listed with um, stock photos and I couldn't do it on any of those sites. And that kind of was my turn off. Like I need it to be easy. 
That is such a great observation. And also, just this is just straight up, Poshmark and uh, Mercari and sites that are mobile only, that's not optimized for business. No. Like business, and if you are an old school seller and you're used to using a camera on your desktop, usually you list much faster because the processing power of a computer is much better than even the iPhone 10. So the systems are better. All the software is designed to list people who list thousands of items on any platform use a computer. Yeah. It's very hard to do this and then scale. So you're an advantage there. And then of course, like Poshmark has allowed sharing finally from desktop and they're all integrating because people are turning just their closet money into a side business. And um, I think I also wanna point out one thing I think is really cool is today for some reason I discovered that I wanna design like a pretty large home-based business. I don't really have the desire to get an office or real yeah. actual employees. I want contractors and a home business. The only thing I can see being ex external is potentially the photographer doing photos offsite. I mean, other than that, I like the idea of a home business. Maybe that's a new concept, but like getting the overhead and it's so different than just doing it in-house. Everything is on PayPal, so taxes are easy. Can't really hide it because they're gonna send a 1099. Right. And there's no cash. And also, I want to point out something that's mind blowing. There's even Duncan in the chat. There are so many resellers that buy all their stuff on eBay to resell on eBay. That's amazing. Yeah. You could literally yeah. <laughs> never leave. You could never leave your house. You could order groceries, order all your inventory online, sell all your stuff online. You could never leave your house. Yeah, that's that's where we're going. <laughs> and I, I mentioned to you before we went on air that, you know, I had never planned on buying another house. You know, I, I sold my place. I was going to move in with my mom to help her out. And I did. And the bottom line was there just wasn't enough space for me to run my business in her house. And so I started looking for office space and office space for, you know, just a 10 by 10 office was like 1500 bucks a month. Ridiculous. So, you know, I found a house and I'm like, I'll use half of the house for eBay business and the other half I'm going to rent out two rooms and a bath to Airbnb because I want it to make some income for me. I don't want to just have another mortgage. And so, so I've been talking to some other resellers like hustler hacks and we want to make a premium store on wheels. We want to make like a, a vehicle, like an RV or something that has them, you know, 600 to a thousand items in it, a premium store and then drive it somewhere. So let's say we came and visited you and just drop off the, um, the premium store car or vehicle and then you could drive it to a different state and it could just be a, a business on wheels and since we all know how to ebay you know your responsibility would just be to replenish it the two weeks you have it and just have it drive around that would be cool you could literally that's an live, interesting thing you could, you could live in your premium store you know one of the, the location yeah so one of the things that i want to do and i think i think i've got this situation you know if i ever wanted to do this i could move my inventory up to um williams and let uh the 14 year old ship it for me but i really want to get an rv and drive around the country and you can't do that with ebay inventory with four thousand listings you just can't do it it's not um feasible uh, but if i you know move my inventory there and then i you know bought stuff and sold it or whatever on the road you could do that but i would love to be able to do that and you know make it a business trip and go see the sites and why not you could if you sold only jewelry yeah exactly something small or whatever but not to be small. anyway that's cool cool well um thank you for joining me today i'll be respectful of your time and um if you ever want to start a channel or you know next time you're in town let me know we'll meet up and have lunch Absolutely. Or if you're in Phoenix, I got an Airbnb, you know, hey, uh, it's not ready yet. But... I got to come down to Phoenix, visit some people down there. There's there's a lot of sourcing in Phoenix area, a lot of sourcing. If you if you do retail arbitrage, if you want to thrift, there's a ton of stuff here. So amazing. All right. Well, thank you for coming. All righty. Take it easy. Bye.